And the Buddha says that illness is unavoidable and has us reflect on that. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't treat our illnesses. After all, the Buddha himself used medicine and the Vinaya, the collection of the monks' rules, is full of information on different medicines for treating different illnesses. In fact, it was through the Vinaya that a lot of Indian medicine or Indian ways of doing medicine spread throughout Asia. As he said, there are some illnesses that respond to medicine, others that will go away whether you take medicine or not, and others that won't go away even with medicine. And it's because of that first type of medicine, <coughs> excuse me, the first type of illness that he recommended treatment for all illnesses. Because you never know ahead of time what kind of illness you have in the terms of those three categories. But you do have to accept the fact that illness will come. It's part of having a body. You think of it as the fine print on the contract when we were born. And because there are some illnesses that just don't go away, and because death is inevitable, we have to train the mind. In other words, we do what we can to treat the body. But we have to remember the body has its limitations. Its potential for health has its limitations. So what we really have to treat is the mind. Look into its relationship to pain and see how it is that we're creating extra pain on top of the pain, the Buddha gives the image of a man who's been shot by an arrow, and then he shoots himself with more arrows. In other words, the physical pain is the first arrow, and the mental pain is that whole quiver of arrows that he shoots himself with. That first arrow is something that we can sometimes do something about, and sometimes not. But that second set of arrows, that's totally unnecessary. And although you may have to accept the fact of pain in the body, you don't have to accept the pain in the mind. You don't view it with equanimity. As the Buddha said, he taught suffering and the end of suffering, and he offered the end of suffering as something you would want. So it's okay to want to put an end to suffering, but you have to do it wisely. You have to attack the problem at the cause. We'd like to get rid of the pain that we have in the mind, but the Buddha says you can't get rid of it unless you see the cause and abandon the cause. So how do we sort these things out, the pain in the body, the pain in the mind? And John Lee recommends using the breath to start with. You use the breath energy in the body to try to create a place that allows you to take a stance in the present moment and not feel threatened by the pain. So say the pain is in the left side of the body, you focus on the right. If it's in the back, you focus on the front. Any place in the body where you can have a sense of well-being as the breath energy flows, and that can be nurtured by the in and out breath. And resist any temptation to go and get involved in the parts of the body that are in pain. And John Lee's image is of a mango. Some of the spots in the mango are wormy. So you take the wormy spots and you cut them out, and you eat the, just the remaining part of the mango. But that's just the beginning step. 
the next step is to think of that good breath energy in the more comfortable part of the body spreading from there and going through the pain parts. You keep your focus, again, focused on the comfortable parts, but you expand your range of awareness. And you think of the breath not just going up to the pain, but going through it. That way it helps to dissolve any bands of tension you may have built around it. And so you're testing to see exactly how much of the, the pain is a result of your unskillful breathing, what the Buddha calls Gaya Sankara, bodily fabrication. After all, the fact that there's pain in the body is problem enough, but you don't want to be adding to it by the way you breathe. And you want to see if the way you breathe can actually help. When I had malaria, I found that simply breathing became laborious. And I realized it because that I was using certain muscles of the body over and over and over again to do the breathing, and they were being starved of oxygen, and so they were wearing out quickly. So I held in mind an image of the breath coming in not through the nose, but through the middle of the forehead, or from the top of the head, or from the back of the head, and thinking of the breath coming in there required that I use a different set of muscles. So the her first set of muscles got to rest, and then another set of muscles got into action for a while. And then when they got tired, I could visualize the breath coming in someplace else. Another set of muscles would help along. Another time when I was having heart problems, I discovered that thinking of the breath energy coming in the left side of the body seemed to help a lot. So you never know where the breath energy is going to be helpful. You try out different things, and you use your imagination to think of the breath energy coming in and out different places, and it will change the mechanics of the breathing. And that way you can give rise to a sense of a safe place in the body, and the fact that you're not simply on the receiving end of the pain. When you're more proactive like this, you're less and less of the victim of the pain. You don't just stay in the line of fire. You're not an easy target, because you're moving around asking questions, trying this, trying that. Sometimes the work with the breath will help the pain, sometimes it doesn't make any difference. But at the very least, you've checked that off possibility, checked that off. But the fact that you do have your safe place allows you to be a little bit more daring in trying to figure out the pain. Because after all, the real problem is not so much the pain, it is the fact that the mind latches on to the pain and then stabs itself with the pain. And that's a matter of perception, the images of the pain that you hold in mind, the images of your relationship to the body that you hold in mind, because you want to see these three things as separate, your awareness, the body, and the pain. And so you have to watch out for any perceptions that glom them all together. So first you ask yourself, is the pain the same thing as the body? Well, the body is made out of the four elements, or the four properties of solidity, liquidity, warmth, and energy. And the pain is none of those. The pain is something else, even though it may seem to be in the same place. It's like it's on a different frequency. Then you're going to ask yourself, is the pain the same thing as the mind? Well, the pain doesn't know anything. The mind is aware. The pain is not aware. The mind has intentions. The pain has no intentions. Learn to see these three things as separate. And that way the mind can be there at the same time that there's pain there, but it's not pulling it in.
the challenge is trying to figure out exactly what perceptions are pulling it in. And you'll find that these will change from time to time. You may have figured out one perception today, and then you try to correct that, and it works today. But then tomorrow you've got another perception. So you have to keep probing around, keep asking questions. Because the ability to separate the mind out from the pain, even though it's based on concentration, is an activity of discernment. to figure out what is it I'm doing that's making the pain pain the mind. And if you're willing to sit with the pain, and the pain is not overwhelming, then you get to see a lot of the mind's conversations around the pain, what the Buddha calls verbal fabrication and mental fabrication. And the pain will become the center for all kinds of complaints. And you get to see a lot of the mind's assumptions written into the complaints. It's a really good place to get to know the mind. You can think of it as a watering hole in a savanna. Suppose you want to make a documentary about the animals in the savanna. You don't go running around the whole savanna chasing them down. You just wait by the water hole, and in the course of 24 hours they're all going to come. So if you want to learn about your clingings and cravings and all the other unskillful things going on in the mind, find some way to hang out around the pain. By giving yourself a good, comfortable place to stay. After all, you're going to be staying in the savanna. You're going to want to have some protection from the sun, protection from the heat. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to make it for the 24 hours. And there are times when you have to rest. You don't spend all your time fighting with the pain. When it gets overwhelming, you take the medicine. John Fung talks about being with John Munn and getting a little perplexed about the way John Munn treated the issue of medicine. There were times when some monks would be sick, and he'd go and he'd give them a Dharma talk and say, What do you want medicine for? Here's your chance to learn the Dharma from the pain. There are other cases where there was medicine, and the monks would refuse to take it, and that John Munn would scold them for being difficult to care for. And John Vuong came up with, with a lesson, okay, if there's medicine, you use it. If there's no medicine, well, you have to face the pain. But you don't face it simply by sitting with it. You learn to use your discernment. We don't gain awakening simply with patience and equanimity. As a John Cha once said, if those two qualities were enough to gain awakening, understanding, then chickens would have all gone to nirvana a long time ago long before human beings. It requires that you be interested and in probing, trying to understand what is this pain? Why does it have such an influence over the mind? And why does the mind grab onto it? What are its perceptions that grab onto it? When you probe and question like this, You come to a lot of understanding. And even before you come to the understanding, the fact that you're willing to question means that you're not just sitting there as an easy target. So try to provide yourself with a safe place. Find which parts of the body you can make comfortable through the way you breathe. And protect them. Look after them. Value them because they'll give you the strength you need in order to deal with this issue that keeps eating away at the heart and mind. The issue of why it wants suffering. It tells itself it wants happiness, but it goes and wants things that make it suffer. Why does it do that?
what we really want is an end to suffering. And that desire is okay. It's simply a matter of learning how to focus your efforts and focus your attention in the right way, in the right place. And that way you give yourself a chance. <laughs>